So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Natalie Ebert from the Institute of Public Health here at the Charité University in Berlin, Germany. And I thank the organizers and the Chinese Society of Nephrology for the invitation for this year's Blood Purification Forum. I'll talk about the kidney measures and their value for detecting CKD and discriminating stage and prognosis. These are my disclosures. So how should we judge the value of current tests? We have two options. I mean, in a way, by prognosis of CKD stage reclassification and the more newly concept of including prognosis. And the CKDPC model uses a prognosis as an outcome. The relative value of CKD diagnosis and prognosis of GFR markers is important to understand beyond the traditional biomarker of creatinine, um, as well as um, albuminuria as an important prognostic marker. And um, I will also include um, examples for differences by populations with regard to GFR estimations, such as race or ethnicity and age. So this conceptual model of um, the course of outcomes and uh, chronic kidney disease, I guess most of you are familiar with this one, um, shows nicely that with increasing um, risk for CKD, you have albuminuria as a marker for kidney damage and eGFR as a marker for um, decreased kidney function. And important, these both measures for understanding the progression to kidney failure and also to include the cardiovascular um, um, comorbidities as well as death. These both components um, will be part of my talk. So in order to stand GFR assessment methods, such as eGFR equations, we need to understand the concept of bias, which is the, di uh, the difference between mGFR measured with an exogenous biomarker such as iohexol and eGFR based on either creatinine or cystatin C, the precision, which is the standard deviation around the bias, which is a random error, and finally, the accuracy, which is the estimated GFR values within 30%, which you see here nicely. So you have the true GFR, the measured GFR, and within 30% of your range lies your eGFR, the red dots. Very important before understanding the problems with eGFR assessment is the fact that in all of us, healthy or diseased, we have a biological variability on a day-to-day -day basis, which is four to 10% in healthy subjects and up to 15% in CKD patients, depending on the assessment method. On top of that, the accuracy of eGFR is an important component for the correct CKD classification. So to give you an example for the P30, um, you have, let's say, an mGFR of 60, then you calculate your P30 value, which is the 30% within your measured GFR value, which then, um, com which then results in 18 mils per minute GFR. And if you that then um, calculate the range of GFR, um, this is 42 to 78 mils per minute. Uh, this includes actually three um, CKD stages. So this is relatively wide. And on top of that, um, let's say for the MDRD equation, your P30 is um, at 81%. That means that additionally 20% of eGFR um, um, results lie outside this range. So this um, is an example to really um, um, emphasize uh, the need to understand that um, there's a wide range of variability when using these equations. And certainly for more reliable CKD stage discrimination, uh, you're all familiar with the KDGO classification system, I suppose, based on GFR and albuminuria. Um, classifying individuals in healthy and unhealthy with regard to uh, kidney disease, the um, P15 value would be certainly more um, 
reliable. So my really, I would say most important message to you today would be, please understand that EGFR equations give only a rough estimate of GFR. There's a large variation in children, adolescents, older adults, and different races and ethnicities, and I will show a little more data on that. Um, GFR equations are always population specific. So if uh, a CK, if an equation was developed in a CKD population, it normally systematically underestimates GFR in individuals with normal kidney function such as the MDRD equation, and an equation developed in healthy individuals, for example, kidney donors, will systematically overestimate GFR in patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, another important factor is that we, uh, in most westernized countries, we have automatic GFR reporting. And again, if you have your GFR result on your lab sheet, still think about it critically and be aware of the wide variability. When uh, another topic is the drug dosing recommendations. They're not based on the eGFR results, which we get through from the lab, but they're based on the Cockroft-Gold equation, and um, which is a clearance um, of Kratny method. Um, and these, this equation was developed in, in 1976. And there's a low awareness within colleagues that uh, we're talking about two different measures when dosing drugs. So, as I showed to you, the KD recommendations for EGVAR equations, they recommend a performance metric of a P30, which is relatively wide, and the, the percentage should be above 90%. And uh, one last aspect, the accuracy of uh, EGVAR equations um, is lower in EGVAR above 60. So, what do we know about renal biomarkers beyond creatinine? Certainly the most prominent non-traditional renal biomarker of GFR prediction is cystatin C. It's a low molecular weight protein produced by all nucleated body cells. It's less influenced by variation of muscle mass, age, and sex. Um, it's also included in the current KDGO um, guidelines as a confirmatory test for uh, stage 3A. Um, but the non-GFR determinants, and I will talk to about that in a minute, um, of systems and see they are not fully understood. Importantly, by now, the uh, lab analysis is, um, uh, is based on a fully automatic standardized assay, which you can actually get in all uh, uh, um, sort of as a routine um, lab parameter. Um, and another topic, which I will touch the second uh, part of my talk is the more that cystatin C is more strongly associated with adverse uh, non-renal outcomes such as cardiovascular events and death uh, compared to, cystatin, uh, to creatinine. It's still a bit more expensive than uh, um, creatinine. So I mentioned the non-GFR determinants to name the most important ones. Um, creatinine you're all aware of the fact that it's increased, uh, it increases, um, it can decrease or increase depending on the change in age. And I will show you that uh, gender is, uh, in female gender, creatinine normally decreased uh, compared to uh, male. And it can vary depending on um, race and ethnicity, which is not the case for cystatin C. Particularly important is the body habitus. Uh, creatinine is increased in muscular um, individuals, not so cystatin C. And the inverse is true for sarcopenic patients with a normally systematically decreased um, creatinine independent of your GFR. The problem with the non-GFR determinants, there are many of them. So I mentioned only some, but you have chronic illness, medication, diet, smoking, and you can see many, many question marks. So we need to understand them better, um, uh, certainly to help us further expand the use of cystatin C. And um, yeah, one tiny adver advertisement of a very current review 
that Mike Schlieberg and myself, we uh, publish in the current opinion of nephrology and hypertension. So if ever, anyone is interested in uh, the, the aspects of the clinical use, um, you can find my summary in this article. So I mentioned age as, um, uh, as an, a factor where a GFR changes over time. And this is a nice example. Um, um, here, what you can see, I'm oh, sorry, here, what you can see uh, that with increasing age, and this is the serum creatinine, um, creatinine increases, let's say, after birth until the age of somewhere around 20. Same holds true for eight and serum creatinine. So the current KDGO guidelines recommend for children the key uh, C kid equation creatinine based and then at the age of 18 the CKD epi equation and um, colleagues um, our colleague Hans Pottel from Belgium and and others what they um, showed is that in a cross-sectional data set of um, a large data set of individuals uh, between the age of 10 and 30 that there is an implausible EGFR change when transitioning from child to adulthood. And uh, on the right side, you can see that uh, particularly here on the right, here you see EGFR calculated with a CKID equation. And then at the age of 18, you switch to the CKD epi. And uh, the result actually is that you have a positive bias of 21 mils per minute at the age of 18 to 20, because the CKD epi um, systematically overestimates GFR. And the same holds true for the CKID equation for the, L, for the older kids with a negative bias of three. So the mean change of GFR is 23 mils per minute just because you use different measures of GFR. And, um, that's a problem and I can, uh, I can sort of say that there is a new equation um, to be um, published very soon in Annals of Internal Medicine to overcome this problem in a very large data set. But it's not published yet, so can't really say much more. Anyway, so the influence of age is also very important at the end of life. So these are data from the Berlin Initiative study where um, I'm a co-PI. And what we did, we recruited individuals at the age of 70 and above. And um, all together, um, a bit more than 2,000 um, people from Berlin. And we measured creatinine and cystatin C and stratified in a five-year age strata. And what you can see again uh, with increasing age, uh, creatinine and cystatin C both um, increase. But at the same time, we measured GFR with IOHexol clearance as a gold standard and could show again that GFR in the majority of our um, um, participants decreases with um, increasing age. Also, independent of the biomarker you use. All right, so um, another um, um, example that shows the influence of age on GFR assessment is this case report. It's uh, our, one of our older study participants, a female of 102 years when we recruited her into the study with a creatinine of 0 0.45 0 .45 and a significantly higher cystatin C. She was, um, a very um, 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 sort of um, thin uh, patient with a low BMI. And what we then did, we estimated the GFR with all different um, creatinine as well as cystatin C and creatinine and cystatin C equations. As, as you can see, the, the examples really vary uh, considerably depending on the biomarker and the equation you use. And altogether, the difference was 94 mils per minute, including three CKD stages. So the second example we show in this case report is an 80 year, 80 year old individual, uh, sorry, is an 88 uh, year old individual and where we measure GFR with IOHexol. Uh, you can't read that, I guess it's 44 mils per minute. Um, but what we found is that the combined equations with creatinine cystatin C, they um, actually showed the most accurate result of GFR. 
And finally, the influence of race on GFR assessment. So muscle mass and creatinine tubular secretion may differ by race and ethnicity. Um, um, the MDRD study was the first to include the race coefficient for African Americans. Um, but the problem is that this coefficient for um, African Americans has shown to be not accurate in other black populations, uh, which could be shown in Africa and Europe and in the Caribbean and as well as Australia. So again, estimated GFR with a race coefficient results in a low prevalence of CKD in African Americans than whites, but this is uh, in contrast with uh, um, a considerably higher risk of end-state renal disease in this population. Asian populations, there's also a wide variety of proposed race coefficients, but the problem is uh, there's a lack of white reference groups. So in HIV positive blacks, the burden of cardiovascular disease is underestimated when using these EGFR equations because, again, they have a threefold higher um, incidence of end stage kidney disease compared to the uh, white um, HIV um, positive patients, which uh, was published in a <clears throat> very nice study by Anker and all. Sorry. Well, and finally, if we measure GFR, we could improve the understanding of non-GFR determinants and certainly would understand better the influences of, a, of race and ethnicity, which uh, is an ongoing, really heated debate in the United States right now. Um, good news is ASN and NKF appointed a joint task um, <clears throat> on the use of race to diagnose CKD, and this committee is gathering broadly information on this topic. So we'll see, uh, and we will, I'm sure we will hear from them very soon. So the second part of my talk is on progression of CKD and, um, <clears throat> and the cardiovascular risk and mortality prediction. So um, a very nice study by um, Kuni Matushita from the um, CKD Prognosis Consortium is a meta-analysis from 24 cohorts um, <clears throat> and they evaluated the risk prediction improvement by creatinine-based EGFR and albuminuria, outcomes of interest with cardiovascular mortality, coronary disease, stroke and heart failure. <clears throat> And uh, what they found is that EGFR based on creatinine and albuminuria was independently, um, independently improved prediction of cardiovascular events, particularly cardiovascular mortality and heart failure. What you can see here, heart failure, this is a C statistic. So the higher the value, the better the, the um, discrimination of, of predictive <clears throat> Uh, predictive um, 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 value of the outcome of the sorry of the um, marker, and um, again you see this is EGFR, ACR, and both uh, uh, the predictability increases um, once you have both EGFR and albuminuria in your um, in your equation. <clears throat> so it this data emphasizes the independent role of ACR. Um, for predicting heart failure, stroke, and cardiovascular mortality. So now moving on to cystatin C-based GFR for de determining um, cardiovascular risk. And you might know that <clears throat> cystatin C has been shown to be a better predictor for cardiovascular outcomes and, cardio, uh, and death. And this has been very nicely shown in a study by Mike Schliepeck in 2013, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. <clears throat> I'm not sure if you can see that, I hope you do. So um, outcome of interest was um, death of any cause and cardiovascular and death of cardiovascular causes. And again, the, uh, they included um, studies of the general population cohorts and um, CKD cohorts. And <clears throat> the main outcome was that uh, the cystatin C-based EGFR better predicted death of any cause as well as cardiovascular death compared to creatinine-based EGFR. 
Then uh, another study by Carmen Peralta of the same group <clears throat> from San Francisco as um, Michael Schliepak. Um, they um, used regards data, a large cohort of, of 26 and more thousand US adults and <clears throat> investigated all cause mortality and incidence of end stage kidney disease and just to run you through their exam uh, to their results um, um, as I said um, out of the 26,000 um, individuals we had about 3,000 um, diagnosis CKD patients are based on creatinine um, EGFR the diagnosis was reconfirmed with cystatin C in about 2,000 individuals. And so what you see is either um, CKD based on creatinine and CKD based on creatinine with um, ACR and the same with uh, both cystatin C, creatinine, no ACR and all three. <clears throat> and this was, um, these are the different percentages for um, the outcomes. And what the authors then did, they looked um, into the ones that were not diagnosed as, C as CKD based on creatinine um, EGFR, and again measured um, cystatin C and identified 1,300 as CKD based on cystatin C. And again, you have individuals without CKD and the ones defined as or, or diagnosed as CKD without ACR and with albuminuria um, and um, the distribution here. But now um, the interesting point was they then calculated the hazard, the adjusted hazard ratio for death. And what you can see here nicely is um, Okay, sorry, I took the wrong screen. So you can see very nicely that by including cystatin C into the equation, your um, um, adjusted hazard ratio increases. And then if you include creatinine, cystatin C, and albuminuria, uh, that's where you get the best uh, prediction for uh, death. And um, surprisingly and interestingly is that uh, the individuals without a CKD based on creatinine, you can see an increased hazard for death in the ones where um, GFR uh, was um, estimated by cystatin C and a decreased GFR was found. So in summary, um, cystatin C and ACR um, was very valuable in identifying high-risk CKD patients, the no CKD or low-risk CKD patients, and the occult high-risk patients. So um, <clears throat> another study which then shows is more like about the clinical utility and the cost impact of cystatin C because um, that's another component. Um, it was conducted by Martin Tal from Great Britain and colleagues and in, in, in a cohort of individuals aged a uh, mean age of 73. And in summary, they found that when um, applying cystatin C as an additional marker, about 7.7 .7 of the population was reclassified as not having CKD, whereas the majority, namely 59, were reclassified as having more advanced disease. So cystatin C may be a useful, may be very useful in settings where creatinine is known to be unreliable. For example, in patients uh, who are very, very, um, who are um, of extreme body habitus, of, particularly with uh, muscle wasting. So just to touch upon um, other um, biomarkers such as beta trace protein or beta 2 microglobulin, um, I just wanted to present them to you as alternative markers. Um, BTP um, originates from the CNS and B2M, part of the um, 1MHC molecule the component. But I think really in summary, I can say that there's only <clears throat> regarding production and metabolism little data and a lot of uncertainty. There's no standardized lab assay. The non gvar determinants are still, as you can see, many unknowns. So I guess we're not ready for clinical use with regard to these biomarkers. The panel of filtration markers, that's a new um, 
new um, development, so-called metabolomics, um, um, published by Andy Levy and, and Joe Korish and others uh, from Tufts and uh, Hopkins. So this is several filtration markers. Uh, through one blood uh, test. And the, the, the charming idea is um, that uh, more markers may minimize the impact of non-GFI determinants and then increase accuracy. Um, but again, uh, in summary, the problem with this panel is there's no standardized assay. There's still, um, we don't know anything about variability and whether it's reproducibility. The non-GFI determinants are not yet identified. And um, particularly, we have no idea about the cost um, uh, for this uh, new and certainly very interesting and, 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 and modern um, um, GFR assessment. So I guess we need some more time and more data to really understand the benefit. Okay, finally, I want to introduced to you to different risk model equations that you can find on the website of the CKDPC consortium. And um, um, let's uh, take this kidney failure risk equation as an example. Uh, it has a really important, the, the risk discussion um, between patient and physicians. It's, it's particularly good for shared decision making. But uh, such decisions, they include a patient's predicted risk of cardiovascular disease and the potential harms. And um, it's important then for the patient to change behavior. Um, the use of these risk prediction scores in clinical practice, uh, however, um, they are not established yet particularly in primary care. And this is certainly also due to the fact that this takes a lot of time because to communicate risk to your patient is complex. But just to give you an example, and I really hope you can read this, um, the question is also the generalizability of these risk calculators. So let's say here um, you can select when you use the risk calculator, whether you come from North America or you're not non-North America, no other options, which then means the external validation in different populations is still sort of lacking. We need more information about these risk calculators in different populations. Um, <clears throat> and then we have another problem, which are the non-uniform recommendations of risk calculators. So let's say you type in like your patient, it's an 85 year old male, non-North American with a GFR 56, and an ACR of 10, and you come up with stage three CKD and the recommendation of um, um, blood pressure um, should be lower than 130 over 80. So just um, to, to introduce um, some European data here, in Europe, uh, we are a little less strict when it comes to um, hyper, uh, recommendations for hypertension. So we would accept um, a, um, in general, particularly for the elder individuals, uh, uh, blood pressure of up to 139. And uh, certainly I hope, I guess you can't read that anyways. What it says here in addition is that blood pressure targets may need to be modified in older patients who are frail and independent. So again, I guess we really need to focus on the patient we treat and need to understand that we, we might not be able to, what like one size fits all approach, um, and not everyone might benefit from a very low or from a so-called normal um, 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 blood pressure. Okay, so finally, um, a new um, concept, um, or yeah, let's say um, the GFR slope and also the change in albuminuria, so the dynamic of um, GFR surrogate endpoint for CKD progression has been introduced by the CKDPC consortium and um, the large data sets um, that um, are gathered there. And there are three, I would like to point out to three interesting publications from Morgan Grams. Um, she investigated um, EGFR slope as a surrogate endpoint for end stage um, kidney disease and showed that slower decline in EGFR was associated with lower risk of subsequent um, end stage kidney disease. 
Then Joe Korish looked at the change in albuminuria and uh, found that change in albuminuria was associated with a subsequent risk of end-stage kidney disease and progression to chronic kidney disease. And finally, uh, AJKD publication by Andy Levy looked into the change in albuminuria and EGFR slope as a surrogate endpoint in clinical trials for CKD and showed a stronger support for change in GFR than albuminuria. So that the dynamic of GFR decrease is very important when talking about progressing to kidney, to end stage kidney disease and associated cardiovascular risk. So to wrap up, please keep in mind, estimated GFR is a rough estimate. There's a large variation as I could show you with regard to children, older adults, different ethnicities. The combination of creatinine and cystatin C provides the most accurate GFR in most individuals, particularly in older adults. We have two key CKD measures, eGFR and albuminuria, both very important for risk prediction. Adding cystatin C, as I showed, to creatinine and ACR for risk prediction is beneficial. Albuminuria is independently associated with risk of mortality, so it's extremely important in patients to really um, measure albuminuria and, and understand the importance of including it into the prognosis. Um, I believe with regard to the risks calculators, we need more external validations and again, looking um, at what's um, happening right now, we understand that the dynamic EGFR slope and change in albuminuria are very important surrogate endpoints with regard to CKD progression. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for, for questions. Thank you.